Yeah, I mean, mem I suppose the politics of memory is a fairly broad field of study. Um, and uh, I mean, I've heard a lot about a memory boom going on from different periods of time. I guess for me, one of the big issues is how uh, memory can serve to reinforce the um, the existing power of states as they are. So memory is often used, official memory, to reinforce certain kinds of status quo situations. Um, and one of the presenters that talked today about uh, um, sort of democratic forms of memory where if most of the people agree with that particular view of history, then that becomes uh, fairly dominant and and, uh, and becomes a way of perhaps cohering lots of people together in, in a social way. So what I've looked at uh, is, is sort of, I suppose, more critical memory studies. So kind of looking at and dissecting ways that um, that different settler states, for example, um, uh, use memory to promote the kinds of status quo that they're interested in promoting. Um, but then also how there's often other forms of memory that, that are contesting that. So every iteration of memory um, also brings with it certain things that are forgotten. And then it can, in its own way, have a kind of structural violence in that it can it can prevent certain other memories uh, creating silences amongst certain people as well. So um, I suppose what I'm looking at is a, in some ways a bit of what Michael Rothberg might call kind of like competitive memory. So different forms of memory that uh, that sometimes compete against each other in, in different ways. Um, and when we're talking about settler states, often there's a politics of memory at work when the state is is suggesting that its its foundation was done in a relatively benign way. So there's often kind of a, an image of a of a social contract or a coming together of, of voluntary parties to create the state. Um, in the case of Canada, we talk about these myths that uh, English Canada and French Canada came together and there are sort of two founding nations of the state. And that becomes central for a long time, at least in the 20th century, for how the, how the state was understood and imagined. Then we have these ideas of multiculturalism, which I think also come in, um, and there's different memories and myths and narratives associated with, with that as well. Um, what we've seen, I think, since uh, after uh, the 20th century and the, the beginning of a lot of discussion of the residential schools and other kinds of issues in Canada is that memory is now becoming more contested and the official narratives of, of, uh, of two founding peoples has uh, been contested very publicly by, um, by a lot of indigenous peoples and, and others as well. So I think it, it becomes kind of an exciting time in terms of looking at different ways that, uh, that the past is understood and understanding that the legacies of the past continue on in, into the future. From what I'm looking at, I mean, there were, there were in the dominant narratives of multiculturalism and the, I suppose the memory or whatever it would be behind, behind that view is that it, certain things that weren't discussed or the, the kind of the backdrop or the, the banal nationalism behind multiculturalism is that the country is founded on English and French people, not really settlers, because that term wasn't really used in the 60s or the 70s, but, but just these two European civilizations. And so other people coming to Canada um, would have their diversity tolerated to a certain extent and they would be welcomed in. Um, but there would always be that assumption in the back of everyone's minds that they would be integrating into um, one or both of these these dominant civilizations. The reason being they were the ones who founded the country. So it would make no sense to come here um, and, uh, and and refuse to, to be part of, of the dominant culture. So I think that became a, a central part of what multiculturalism was. But it's th there's different varieties and they talk about thin versions and thick versions. And the thin version is, is basically that you, um, you might have certain foods that you eat, you might have certain cultural practices and different things like that, but that ultimately you would, the rest of you, other than a few trappings of, of slight difference, would, would essentially be, be Canadian. But Canadian, uh, that term, you know, is, is, I suppose, more contested now than before, but that would just simply be English or French Canadian, um, and then you would you would kind of integrate into one or the other or both of those things. Uh, but now I think because 
in part because of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but I think just a, lot, a work of a lot of a lot of people calling out certain things. There's some truths that have become a little bit more obvious. Um, one is is uh, is that people were prevented from coming to Canada f from from the very beginning. Uh, so you know, Asian people, South Asian people, peoples from Africa, from different parts of the world were were not able to come, and so when you look at the primarily sort of white face of Canada, um, that was that was an engineered demographic situation. Um, and uh, and had they let all of these people in from other places, then maybe we would have had a different kind of, of political system. It might have been one um, where there was a lot more multi-ethnicity, maybe other religions might have been more tolerated. We might have even seen forms of consociationalism develop uh, in different ways with Different kinds of power sharing, so uh, where where the politics emerges out of different cultures rather than just the English and French cultures. Um, it's also become, I think, more obvious too that uh, certain kinds of memories, which I suppose were suppressed or not readily discussed, are are, are coming out a lot more. Um, part of this is is the indigenous histories, which I've talked about a little bit already. But there's a long history of um, of black people living in in Canada. And uh, and that history really has been suppressed or, or not really of interest to to many people for a long time. And that history only in the last say I'd say five or ten years has really big, come to light a lot more. And so we know that in a sense that the idea that multiculturalism starts in the '60s is is in fact wrong. That there was Canada was much more multicultural and multiracial at different times in its history than. Than the official narratives would suggest. Uh, much of the story of multiculturalism is that Canada is basically white, and then the white people let in all these other people later on, and then they're super nice to them, and then these people behave well and contribute to Canadian society, and so we have this vibrant mosaic. But there's there's a lot more to the story uh, than that, uh, which includes negative ways that non-white people were treated in Canada in the past. But also the fact that they were there, um, that they were around the country. There are places like Africaville in, in the Maritimes where people were, uh, black people were basically forced out. So there's that whole history that is now coming to light a lot more. Um, and I think part of it would have to do with um, what some have called a sort of unconscious ideology or an unconscious bias about what things are sayable in. In, in in public life and what things are just not going to be acceptable. They're not going to be listened to or you'd be accused of exaggerating or trying to to divide up the population rather than fostering unity. But th there's a lot more space now for different narratives to be told from different perspectives. And I think to have those narratives uh, recognized and maybe respected more than in the past, which isn't to say there's not a lot of backlash against it, because there obviously is, but there's more support for people to come forward and say, this is what happened to my ancestors, or these official narratives of multiculturalism, or the way that the state was founded, or whatever, um, are not true for, for my experiences or for the community that I come from. And I think that, that marks a big, possibly a big change in, in the way that narratives used to work. Um, it's interesting, too, with indigenous peoples, because uh, in the 60s and 70s, during the sort of the era when they were trying to put together this whole idea of biculturalism and bilingualism between English and French, uh, there were indigenous people saying, well, we want, uh, we want the state to recognize that there are, in fact, three founding peoples in the country, not, not two. And uh, that, generally speaking, was, was rejected, as far as I understand, by, by those who are putting together that particular narrative of what the state should look like. There are indigenous peoples who will say like words like colonizer or other things are more appropriate than settler. That settler sounds something rather benign. I mean, you're just kind of settling down. And and uh, whereas there's maybe an active, sometimes structurally violent process that you know settler colonialism describes, which is that um, you know, indigenous peoples are you know have have problems from you know from structural violence from the police and other groups and that sort of thing. So that there's there's ways that society is 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 very actively trying to suppress 
their rights to self-determination or even just people's rights to move around freely and act as they'd like to do in, in, in urban environments or other environments as well. So um, the idea of settler can sometimes seem, I suppose, seem benign to some people. Um, I guess for, for those who are sort of from a European settler or a white settler uh, perspective but don't like that term, I mean, I suppose the term implies that uh, at some level that unless you're indigenous, you don't really belong to the land or belong to the country. And then maybe there's this implication that the people should have to leave or that they should feel that their identity is inauthentic in some way, that they're not actually a Canadian, but they're actually a transplanted Irish or English or Welsh or French or German person who has, who's colonizing somebody else. Um, and so that that concept could be perceived possibly by some as kind of insulting or or seen to disparage the fact that maybe their family's been here for for a few generations or something like that. Um, but I think, from my perspective, that the term settler kind of is is you know is one side of a relationship that uh, indigenous peoples and settlers have with one another, um, and often framed not so much in BC but in other provinces through different treaties. So in Treaty 4 lands in Saskatchewan, where I'm from, the idea that we're all treaty people is, is very important. And so, uh, so being a settler or being indigenous implies that there is some kind of treaty-based relationship uh, that is ongoing, um, where people have to work together uh, sometimes, sometimes they do their own thing, but uh, through, through different forms of, of respect for one another, for difference, for maybe the similarities that people share as well. Um, and as well that there's there's a common responsibility to to care for the land and the waters and the plants and the animals and that sort of thing. So I think if you think of settler as being one side of a relationship that's based on treaties and understandings and respectful relations, then it's not it's not a problem. Um, in New Zealand, where I spend uh, a lot of time doing research and and and, and work. Um, the uh, there's kind of a division between uh, Tangata Fenua, who are the people of the land, the indigenous peoples, and Tangata Tiriti, or the people of the treaty, uh, who are and 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 both are seen to have like the the people of the treaty, who are the settlers, have a relationship with the land and also the indigenous peoples because of the treaty. So that becomes central to how that relationship evolves. So I think if you see settler as someone who has a relationship with indigenous peoples and that it should be a respectful relationship through different understandings of treaty then i don't think it's i don't see it as a as a, as a pejorative term but um but i think there are some you know there, there's terms like white nativism and stuff which i think kind of imply that the the white people are like the the real owners and controllers of the land and the state and so if there's a sense that those that what is taken for granted is seen as a privilege and then as an undeserved privilege and then as an undeserved privilege that needs to be contested you know those those three elements are very difficult i think for for a lot of people who you know who are basically used to just not thinking of themselves as anything other than a canadian like i play hockey i go to tim hortons i've got a job you know i you know I buy a new car every two or three years and it's some kind of Chevy or whatever. I mean, I don't know, whatever it might be that, you know, is, is important for identity. Uh, issues of whiteness don't necessarily come into this. Um, and the idea that, like, certain, certain things are not universal, I think, becomes difficult for some people to understand or, or to accept. So.